I am Lori Beth Larson from Central Lakes College here in the middle of Minnesota. And today we have four fabulous uh, panelists um, helping us understand how they've overcome some of the challenges um, transforming workforce programs with OER and open practices. Our agenda today is a little bit of a CCC OER overview if this is the first time you're joining us. We'll hear from our panelists. Our panelists today are Jessica Curran and Whitney Hyans from Salt Lake Community College, Sharon Sampson from Grossmont College, Jim Begatka from Moraine Park Technical College, and Tarek Morris from Lynn Benton Community College. As we finish, we'll have some time for questions. Uh, this is being recorded, as you know, right now so that you can share it. Uh, we have a few upcoming events to tell you about and how you can stay in the loop. We do have a survey to uh, quickly complete before you take off today. You are uh, more than welcome, if you haven't already, to join CCC OER in completing our mission to expand awareness and access to high quality OER. We support faculty choice and development, foster regional OER leadership, improve student equity and success. We have about 108 members from 36 states. All four of our panelists this today are from our members of CCC OER. Since this is our last live meeting before Open Education Week, we wanted to tell you a little bit about those events or how to get involved. Una, do you want to tell us a little about that? Uh, certainly, Lori Beth. Yeah. Um, so the um, Open Ed Week is usually the first full week of March. And so it will be March 7th through 11th uh, this year. And it's a global global open education celebration. So uh, people from around the world will be um, participating in this. Uh, there's opportunities for you to contribute um, events or um, or projects that you work on at your um, institution or organization. And those will be posted on the OE Week uh, website. Um, and if you're currently not in a place where you're ready to contribute, there's still a lot of opportunities to participate in the events of that week and to share those with folks on your campus. So we hope you can join us and, and enjoy that week. Thank you, Lori Beth. Thank you. So let's go ahead and get started with our first panelist. Welcome to Jessica Curran and Whitney Hines from Salt Lake Community College. I'm gonna stop sharing now so that you can share. Sorry, I think we're unmuted now. Hello. Thanks for having us today. So uh, I am Jessica Kern and this is Whitney King Hyans and we work at Salt Lake Community College. We teach graphic communications and photography courses within the visual art and design CETE program. We are quite passionate about OER and we use it in almost every single one of our own courses. In today's presentation, we would like to focus on one specific project we've worked on together. It's an OER textbook called Image Manipulation for Graphic Artists that we use in our Art 1280 Photoshop software course. And hi, I'm Whitney. Um, I'll start with this first slide, motivation. Textbooks really don't exist. I know it's surprising to say that there really are no textbooks for us to use for this class. When we started out, we were using a text that was like Adobe Photoshop's classroom in a book, which seems to be a, a similar format compared to other books out there. But this book just wasn't good, a good fit for us for a lot of reasons. A key reason is our class is designed to be a foundation for several disciplines in the arts. Our, in our department, we have graphic communications, 
uh, graphic design, illustration, photography, website design, animation, and multimedia. Books tend to be designed more towards just one of these disciplines and not all. And we wanna have students make the connection between concepts and skills. With students coming from these differing specialized areas, our job is to make sure we include the ways various artists use Photoshop. We need to make sure that students not only have the skill sets needed, but can make the connection as to how these skill sets are utilized. I think we all experience this next motivator on the list. Technology changes rapidly. Software is updated just about monthly. And with that, books become out of date and irrelevant very fast. When updates happen, all the time spent on building curriculum around a, a book needs to be changed along with the text. And there just isn't enough time or money for that. Because of how we decided to create this text, which Jessica will talk about more in depth in a minute, we're able to make changes to our text and push these update, updates out directly to our instructors and students anytime we need to. So in Photoshop updates, we're able to go in and update the text to reflect the updates immediately, which is really nice. Lastly, books are expensive and students, particularly community college students, really need help in this area. Creating our own textbook saves students money and ensures that all students have access. We would actually like to talk about some of the many lessons that we've learned throughout our OER process first, before we start talking about our process for developing and implementing our OER textbook. We did a lot, a lot wrong along the way, but by trying and experimenting and learning from our mistakes, we have been able to create something that we are truly proud of. The first and most important lesson we learned is that you don't have to be everything to everyone. We started our journey by trying to produce every aspect of a course that someone might need, including a text, slides that you might use during class, thousands of quiz questions, projects with rubrics, discussions, worksheets, and more. You name it, and we tried to make it and publish it for others to use. It became an overwhelming process that was not helping to support our goals because in reality, nobody wants you to hand them 100% of everything that they're going to teach. But we found that if we made a textbook with clearly defined chapters and learning objectives, it would allow other instructors to pick and choose which chapters to use and in which order. We also learned really quickly that we needed to take into consideration that the subject matter we teach becomes out of date very quickly. The way that we create and share our content needed to be flexible enough to be able to be updated on the fly as quickly as a software that we're using changes. We went through many iterations of how we present content in this course. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but one really, really big mistake we made was recording comprehensive lecture uh, playlists on YouTube. We actually made it made the mistake twice. <laughs> Whitney and I recorded informal lectures for every chapter in the book and then had to re-record them a year later when they became out of date. And we didn't learn our lesson because we did it again and we, ma we made another 100 plus videos that also quickly became out of date. After the second round of videos, we took a step back and we said we needed to focus on functionality being our top priority. It is exhausting when everything that you create becomes out of date so quickly because an option within the software program is updated. Every decision that we've made from that point forward has been about functionality and what's best for our students, even if that means that we don't fall into the typical path of what most OER users look like. I personally have felt that I have imposter syndrome because I care so passionately about OER, but I don't feel like I'm part of the cool kids club that has tons of resources online that I can grab and modify. We work with truly wonderful people at Salt Lake Community College who are always trying to help us find OER for our area. They'll go and they'll search and they'll find resources for us to use, but we can't use them because the content that they're finding is either out of date or it's limited in its scope. Most of the popular OER websites, they don't even have a section for the subjects that mm. we teach. So in, at a certain point, we just had to accept that it's okay that we don't fit into the conventional OER mold and that small impacts are, in, are important too. If we look at it from a student's perspective, the impact of using OER for one student in our class is no less impactful than a single student in a chemistry class that's using an OER textbook. That textbook may be used by a million students across the country, but to a single student in our class, they're getting the same benefit as a single student in any other class that's using an OER textbook. So as far as our process goes, 
we spent literally years uh, learning what not to do the hard way, uh, which then allowed our actual process for developing the OER text to be relatively straightforward. For a long time, we tried to fit into the mold of other OER textbooks. Our school, for example, likes to use press books. So we tried to make that work, but we ultimately went with Google Slides to present our text. We understand that there are pros and cons to using Google Slides. Accessibility, for example, is not great, but it checked many of the boxes we needed. The slides could be embedded directly into a Canvas course. We can update the parent slide and then the changes will flow directly into all the embedded copies and more. The longest part of our process was actually mapping out the chapters for the book. There's a lot of foundational content in our book that you could argue should be taught first, but you can't teach everything all at once. So we had to group chapters together that we felt scaffolded learning for someone reading the text. We were also thinking about this in terms of being part of a course. So we wanted to make sure that there were natural breaks for creative projects or where exams could be taken. We then divided and conquered. We each wrote chapters individually and then proofed each other's chapters. We asked our colleagues to review chapters as we finished them. And I think the most important thing we did was we had people that know absolutely nothing about our subject read and prove the book for us. They had some really great insights that we didn't see because we understand the content that's being presented. Once we were happy with the first draft of the book, we embedded it into our own courses in Canvas. We ran those classes for about a year to see how things were working before we ultimately published the text on our own website, which is opengraphicarts.org, where it is now available in what we're calling version 1.0. We know that we still have work to do, but the text is in a place where it can be used and it can be shared with others as needed. And student benefits. As teachers, we all want students to be successful. And the great thing about the design of this textbook is that it's easily embedded directly into the course. Each unit in our class or module has its corresponding chapter embedded right on the unit's page. Students can view the textbook as a slideshow Students also have the option to print it out, print out the slides as a PDF. So it's more like a traditionally printed textbook. As a bonus, we also have included open source videos to, to supplement the text and have created our own videos demonstrating more specific skills in the assignments and just a few videos this time. <laughs> Doing this not only helps our students out, but it also helps out uh, our other faculty and adjuncts that are teaching the class. All of the content is there to help guide their teaching, not prescribing how they teach and not limiting their autonomy. Our college is really supportive of OER, which Jessica mentioned, and that's great. With this support, both Jessica and I personally are pushing to be OER in all of our classes. I know Jessica purchases a lot of supplies for students out of our visual art design funds, buying pens, markers, color swatches, paper for students for their projects. I teach mostly photography classes. Buying, camera, buying a camera can be a huge expense. So what I've done over the years is collected cameras and gear so students can check out these things rather than buying them, especially if it's not in their budget. Students pay so much money in tuition that they really shouldn't have to pay more for a great successful education experience. And to wrap things up, if you'd like to check out the textbook for Art 1280 Photoshop software, here's a link on the, on these slides to Open Graphic Arts, and that's an OER website that Jessica has created where we post our work. The text is called Image Manipulation for Graphic Artists. Take a look and let us know what you think. And thanks so much for having us. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Such a great uh, overview. Thank you so much for being willing to share your process as well as the, the mistakes. The mistakes make it very relatable, I think was one of the comments. Thank you. And I would like to uh, introduce Sharon Sampson. Uh, Sharon comes from Grossmont College and uh, will be sharing about OER and open pedagogy. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharon Sampson. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I am a CTE, Faculty Administration of Justice. Um, so I wanted to talk about my journey um, in OER um, and using open pedagogy um, and administration of justice. So my lens is from a parent of a student who is at a community college and the cost that I actually have to invest 
um, in textbook every semester, and I could give you an accurate ledger on the amount of money I spend every semester on his textbooks. I am also a student myself, and I have a detailed ledger of the amount of investment I have to spend in that um, area. Um, and I would prefer, I would like to see some movement um, in all of these spaces where faculty and professors are really looking at the added costs um, to uh, students. Um, as an administration of justice faculty, um, we understand that our, some of our students transition from our system directly in the industry, and some do have the option of transferring um, to a four-year institution. So this is a journey, it's an iterative process. I first started off in OER for selfish reasons, um, personal reasons as a parent. And of course, like I said, I'm a student and understanding the costs. Now, as I've evolved and moved forward further into this journey, I understand that it's kind of hard to pivot really quickly when things happen, especially with administrative justice, criminal justice field, um, with the community questioning um, our training, our curriculum, and what we're doing instead of our classrooms when it comes to our students being trained in law enforcement, being trained in EMT, uh, being trained to do security detail or any other law enforcement, because many do start in our system, in the California Community College system um, here. So how do you pivot? How do you then allow the voices of the community to be reflective in your classrooms if you are confined to just textbooks, traditional textbooks? the information is going to be outdated based on what's happening in the community and you need to be able to be flexible. So based on this new lens, I now have the opportunity to include my students' voices um, in this journey and to expand my community. Um, like I said, this is an iterative process. It's not something that you can do alone. Um, it's not something that you can take on um, independently because you are working so closely uh, with other people and it's a helpful process. If you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So this is just an overview. Um, my agenda is fluid. I wanted to start off with a, um, a high level overview talking about the California Community College um, Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Oakley, who did a call to action subsequent to the murder of George Floyd. Um, my journey um, in AOJ uh, to include anti-racist pedagogy with OER, looking at an inclusive curriculum and design and commitment to action and strategies. And hopefully there'll be an opportunity for q and If we can go to the next slide, please. So what was the call to action? Subsequent to the murder of George Floyd and all of the community questioning what we're doing in our classrooms, what we're doing in our system, our chancellor wanted us to step up and really take a pause and reflect on what we were doing to move um, our, our pedagogy, to improve how we're training, how we are in, um, sending our students into industry from the classroom into uh, criminal justice fields. So that, I always question myself, am I doing enough? As a faculty of color, I feel sometimes the burden um, because I fall into both sides, being in law enforcement, being a faculty of color, being questioned by the community. Like, what are you doing to move the needle to make sure that our students are prepared to deal with our diverse workforce, to deal with the diversity in the community and to address some of the wrongs. So the burden is heavy. And part of this journey, it, like I said, I, I'm going to continue to repeat that it's a journey, it's not something that's going to be done overnight, is to step up and respond to that call to action. So Chancellor Oakley specifically asked for us to take a deeper dive into our practices and to come up with some specific strategies to improve what we're doing uh, moving forward. So inviting everyone into this space included the voices of all of us collectively on our campus, not just um, AOJ faculty. If you can go to the next slide, please. So how does OER provide a roadmap to respond to this call of action? Um, and how, what is the opportunity? So I saw this not just as a challenge, but as an opportunity to really move and to quickly respond to some of the changes that could be immediately done. If you are confined to a traditional textbook uh, that shapes 
um, norms, that shapes policy and procedure, that really structures how you design your classroom, because that's how I started in, in, as a professor. Um, I was stuck on my textbook and my course was designed based on how that textbook was designed. So chapter by chapter, I followed the model of that textbook. This does not give you that opportunity to respond to a call to action, whereas OER provides that space and that opportunity to involve and to really um, pivot and to make those needed changes as you move forward um, in your courses. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is what I did, and I'm going to um, just be open to any feedback and comments. I reviewed my own curriculum collectively as a department um, at Grossmont, all of the faculty got together to look at some strategic strategies that we could implement in our campus. I'm also part of a statewide uh, CTE committee that we're looking at this as well. We reviewed the content um, analysis of our syllabi and our instructional material. And I put an and with a period um, with a little space to let you know that this is a journey and that we're continuing to look at the process. If you go to the next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna have you skip to the next one for me, please. Thank you so much. So this is a tool um, that I was provided um, as I took a course to look at a roadmap and the information will be sent to you if you wanna look at, there's an actual booklet that goes with this open pedagogy uh, project roadmap to understand what is your scope when you're start, starting off in OER? What kind of support do you need to make sure that you are on track, that you don't get frustrated and stressed because it's, an, it's a huge undertaking and to consider your student voices and then how do you, sh how do you share and sustain uh, the information? So my personal scope, like I said, in AOJ is to really look at all of the courses that I facilitate to make sure there's a social justice component in all of the courses. I know that I was never doing enough I still feel that I'm not doing enough in that area and there is room for growth and improvement. So my scope is to make sure that my students have a comprehensive, that they understand that their role in this field should include a social justice lens. I don't try to um, force my students um, into participating uh, in this uh, roadmap in this project, but I do want to provide them with the opportunity for them to have their voices be heard, because many of the, our traditional textbook, and I'm just going to be very frank, um, the ones that I've used in the past, many um, of the offenders that are represented who are arrested in handcuffs are people of color. How do I expose my students in this field to say, hey, there are people of color who are professionals. They're not just criminals that are represented in this textbook. They're people who are, they're um, professionals who are judges, who are probation officers, who are in all different areas of law enforcement. And some of our textbooks that I've used are one-sided. Pretty much every picture in the textbook shows many of the fenders and handcuffs as people of color. How do you then change that narrative? So our students, whom some of them are, are um, students of color, see themselves reflected positively. And for those who are not, who are from the dominant culture, see positive images, positive case studies, positive things about other diverse um, individuals in a different lens. So they're not exposed to it, in their household, they weren't exposed to it in elementary high school, and now they're in our system. How do you then change the narrative if we're relying on textbook that gives you firm definitive um, narratives about other um, ethnicities, other cultures, then it's up to us in this uh, process to change that. So if you can go to the next slide, more, please. So here's what I decided to do, and this is something that I'm still working on. Um, curated lesson plans and making sure that my assignments are renewable. I decided subsequent to um, the call to action, look at all of the lesson plans, objectives, look at all of my assignments to make sure that my students are able to contribute and participate. Like I said, as I'm moving forward, I've evolved um, a lot more um, because initially in this process, some of my students were not very comfortable um, in having their um, work 
the open license. And I realized that I was not laying a clear foundation. I was not preparing them enough for them to understand that they have the opportunity to teach the next generation to be proud of how they're contributing to the process. So I think I've grown in this process as well to understanding and reflecting what am I doing for those who are not comfortable um, in engaging um, in this project who are unaware. So this semester or the previous semester, I would say, I, I had about 100% of my students who were interested in having their work be open licensed for them to continue um, the process to have their work be shared with this class. So it is amazing. I feel um, they feel good about it. Um, there is gonna be a follow-up to um, for those students who are sharing their work to see how it's improving and impacting the ones who just started last week, because um, I promised to provide them with an update and they do have access to all of the database to go in and see how their work is being improved upon by this current um, semester um, enrolled students. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this is a, a guide to making textbook with students. I just wanted to provide this as a source of support. Um, it's available as open uh, license. Uh, you can also do other things in, instead of doing a textbook. For me, that was a huge undertaking. I adopted some of the information um, that was previously um, in different databases versus trying to start with a textbook. I'm just being very transparent when I tried that process and teaching during the semester and being a student and trying to mentor my own son who has a special needs, I found it overwhelming. So I started with the curated lessons first, and now I'm at a space where I can work collectively and collaboratively with a colleague on working in a textbook. So if you are, depending on where you are in this journey, don't, my advice is to you not to start at the, the deep end, start at the shallow end. And I thought I could be able to do it over a summer it was epic failure. Um, I felt overwhelmed and I felt isolated in this process. I'm open um, collectively with my colleagues. Um, we are working together on this. So I feel um, a lot better in terms of where we are in this process. So please don't feel that you need to start off um, in this work um, at, the, at the deep end. Start at the shallow end, wherever your, your comfort level is. So my first process was, let's start off with some curated lessons. My students were given a project for all of my classes where they had to really engage in looking at some of the policies and procedures from a normal tech, traditional textbook, figuring out how in today's day, where is the missing social justice aspect of the information in the traditional textbook and how would they like to see that move forward? It was impressive. Um, to know that our students come with their own lived experiences and when they feel that their voices are heard, the level of involvement um, and commitment to this work really transformed a lot of the ways some of them are moving forward um, in the field of law enforcement. Um, some never considered those options. If the policy or the law says, for example, a no-knock warrant, in a traditional textbook, it just gives you the law, it tells you what it is. But if you take a deeper dive, how was that policy um, developed? How was that voted into law? Who was involved? My students are now at a level where they're questioning and they're rewriting the script so it can be a lot more comprehensive. And I can do that with OER, uh, with an open pedagogical um, framework. So you can go to the next slide, please. So our students. We talk about, or at least I know through my own lens, that our students come with a level of experience. I have students transitioning from the military who were military officers, military police, um, people in our community, students who are transitioning uh, or changing careers. And we, we understand that our students come with diverse backgrounds, but how do we elevate our students' lived experiences in our classroom? Are we just facilitating classes and having them engage in the assignments through what we're giving them, how do they then engage at a different level? So then I had to do my own reflective um, survey and practice to see how am I involving my students in this work? 
And how do I do that with an equitable lens that I'm not just expecting students to do a curated lesson and just have it be a part of their project for uh, the course? How can I then make sure that it's equitable, that I'm not abusing my students who have this experience and for those who don't, how do I then curate that balance? So it was other practices that have done some research to figure out there are ways that you can involve your students without overwhelming them, uh, want to elevate their voices and not necessarily just use it as a project for them to be able to earn a grade. So moving forward, I've considered, um, I've applied for a grant to um, provide financial support um, services for those students who have done a very thorough job. How could, how could, how could I support students who are um, parents, who are in school, who are working a job and in our community college system? And then how do I balance that without overwhelming them once again. It's not equitable. Initially, when I started off, it was just curated lessons. It was part of their project so they can see the social justice lens. Now that I've moved forward in this work, I'm looking at other ways to make sure that those that need to be compensated are because I've had students who have done a comprehensive job on taking on this work. And they're going to then transfer those skills directly in the industry. As students right now who are going through the background process um, for their law enforcement selected career. And this is going to carry through their career trajectory as they move forward. So I, I am in a different space and I just want to share that aspect of my journey. Can you go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. So I wanted to read this quote um, because this resonates with me. This is something that I put in my classrooms that despite attempts to attend to racial problems, uh, United States higher education has not come very far in addressing systems of white dominance. And this um, quote is a quote that was selected by one of my students in this iterative process. Um, because, and this is coming from a student who comes from the dominant culture, it didn't come from a student of color. They've included this quote in their curated lesson to say their eyes are open, they understand that the work that needs to be done, and they want to be a part of the process to make sure that when they are in the field, that they change what's happening in our field um, in, in criminal justice. So just wanted to share that quote that was selected by one of my students. Give one more slide for me, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Laurie. I really appreciate the time. And I, I, I'm, my family's from the islands. I just came back from the islands. So my, my dialect comes back and forth to that fast dialect. <laughs> so I know I probably zoom right through uh, just coming back from, um, from Belize. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. I know we'll have time for questions at the end and uh, so much appreciate what you have to say and your honesty about your, your uh, process here. Thank you. I'd like to turn it over now to Jim Begotka and you have your own slides to share. Thank you. Okay, well, um, hello and thank you. And uh, especially thank you to uh, the Community College Consortium of OERs and Open Education Global for sponsoring this event today and inviting Marine Park Technical College. Um, I'm an instructor of business management and small business entrepreneurship, and 100% of my assignment really is dedicated to serving the incarcerated population. So part of the journey that I've had, uh, which is only about two years now, specifically with OERs and in serving this, this population, um, involves just, where I'll kind of take you through, is just some of the considerations I had in terms of, I think, a common theme that we're hearing is how well um, the OER options that might be out there align with our curriculum. And so certainly that was a, you know, a big factor. But then once we decided to adopt uh, specific OERs, then we had to work out a number of different things, you know, like, well, students still kind of preferring print. So I'll share a number of things there, our learnings uh, through this program. Um, so part of the, um, so we could kind of grow some legs, if you will, or develop some momentum in, in adopting OERs, we really needed to at Marine Park Technical College um, 
begin with uh, aligning, first of all, with our strategic plan. So you kind of see on this slide that uh, you know, we have some, some communication here to our employee base in terms of you know, what our strategic plan is. But then when it comes to you know, the, the, the goal of increasing um, enrollments, that is specifically where we looked at adopting OERs, um, in part due to, again, a common theme that we're hearing. Uh, is in reducing that cost uh, of education through uh, adoption of OERs. So it's about a three-year journey. We're right, we're right in, the, in, the, in the middle of that two to three-year transition. Um, and I'll just share a few things in terms of uh, how our journey went. Uh, first and foremost, though, with this population, um, as an instructor, as an educator, uh, look, knowing about OERs, but never really worked with working with them in the past, what was really tempting um, and, and what tempted me to, to really give far more consideration to OERs um, was, um, as I learned about, if you can follow the cursor there, as I learned about um, OERs and you know, the, the different types of licensure and how we can use as is or reuse or mix, um, uh, you know, just a, a lot of flexibility there that immediately just grabbed my attention. And then specifically with this population that we are serving. Now we have in our district area, we have five different state run um, Department of Correction facilities. And so these facilities, we work with each of them individually to make an arrangement for our students to participate uh, through a modified Canvas platform um, in, in our associate degree programs. Um, it was kind of counterintuitive in terms of the modified Canvas platform because I think we all learned that when we teach online, we want to take advantage of all the bells and whistles and everything that online learning and, and the, the tools within our platform, within our LMS platforms uh, can offer. But uh, in serving this particular population, the incarcerated population, there's a big uh, you know, rule we had to comply with, and that is that students cannot converse or dialogue, communicate with other students. And so the communication is just between myself and them and vice versa. Um, and, and even in the, um, in, in as far as multimedia and embedding, um, you know, that into our learning plans and into the, you know, the courses, we were severely limited there. Um, so the first time, in all honesty, I looked at some OERs, um, different ones had, uh, you know, I should say that there was some, some factors with the recency of the information. Um, there was also, you know, looking at graphics and images and how robust and engaging were some of the books that I first looked at. Um, so let's just say that, um, you know, my first view of OERs, uh, you know, really didn't inspire me a lot until I really started looking more at this is a need. And then what is prevailing is the need to serve this population and reduce their costs. Because as, as a state, as an incarcerated individual in the state uh, facilities, there really is no income. And they're really, unless the college, and we're hoping that in 2023, uh, we'll, we'll reach this milestone, but uh, unless there is um, the second chance Pell Grant, our students who are, who are incarcerated in state prisons are paying for this themselves. Um, many have uh, family members that are, that are um, uh, sponsors and they help us that way. But when we look at the overall impact uh, of education, whether it's OER adopted or not, but just the impact of education, it's so, so extreme and profound. You know, we can look at on typically 2.1 million individuals incarcerated per year, about 95% will be released. 67% will reoffend uh, within first, within five years. Um, and then we can look at, if we skip on down here, if there's any amount of education, we can reduce that rate of recidivism. Um, Studies out of the Bureau of Justice have indicated that uh, based on their research and their follow-up studies that after uh, five years and 10 years, so time is definitely a, a major factor after release in terms of their recidivism rates. But just the amount of education also we can see by the statistics that I'm sharing here. 14% recidivism rate for those with an associate degree, 5.6% for a bachelor's and then those that have the opportunity to pursue a master's degree while incarcerated, and there are those opportunities, the statistics have shown with the follow-up studies that zero recidivism rate can occur. So that information alone, you know, also coupled again with, you know, uh, we are in our, the district or the, within our district and then the, the uh, institutions that we serve uh, being state funded, 
um, these individuals have no source of income. Uh, so they don't even have, if you will, you know, this measly amount, if I might add that, that value judgment there of income that they might earn through different jobs. So they really, this, you know, reducing the cost for students really is significant. And that was a prevailing, you know, thought that took me through and kept me looking at OERs. I don't know how standard this process is for everybody, but it, it seems that with my colleagues here that are co-presenting this, this, uh, graphic that we have on the side here is, is pretty standard. I mean, we have to take time aside once there's something that's kind of piqued our curiosity and our interest. We have to set time aside to look. Uh, look at our current text, look at those that are out there um, in the OER world, if you will. So, you know, learning about all the different uh, repositories and I'm finding that uh, it seems like almost monthly there's, there's uh, either an individual uh, educator that might open up resources and share or there's more formalized um, entities. Uh, that we'll share, but I definitely went through steps one through five and got to this point in step five where I was looking at, okay, uh, for marketing principles, as an example, that course in their business management and small business entrepreneur programs, um, we had, I had a decent uh, set of, of textbooks uh, that were OERs that I could use, but then that step in looking at how well do they align with the curriculum, really getting down into you know, the competencies and the learning objectives and how we break that down, um, you know, was necessary so that I could determine, is this a book that I might want to use from a supplemental standpoint, or is this a full adoption? So that then, um, you know, after we kind of got into, you know, examining different books and then sharing that as a team and making some decisions as to which book was, you know, probably the best option, we also formulated a plan to plug the gap. And there tended to be gaps in terms of, you know, maybe there wasn't an exact alignment in content uh, with our learning outcomes, or maybe there was some information that was a bit dated and we needed to you know, uh, update. Uh, but we needed to kind of come up with a plan that was kind of just a standby accepting that, yep, even if we go with the full adoption, there still, need, there still is a need to kind of look at, uh, at plugging some gaps in whatever, wherever that might be. Um, so very definitely then the, the licensure was key. Um, I found that I, as I was modifying, as the licensure allowed, modifying some of the uh, textbooks we adopted, uh, just simple things. Uh, and I kind of laughed when we were doing some of our rehearsals with Jessica Whitney saying, please sign me up for your first classes because I could certainly use some, some skill sets in Adobe and things like that. Just in repaginating um, you know, the book or changing the table of contents, uh, um, adding appendices and other resources so that we could address plugging the gap there. Um, but once we adopted, and um, again, considering this, this population, uh, a lot of the feedback that we were getting was they really appreciated our efforts to save cost. Um, however, they really also appreciated the time to spend with their resources. And the classrooms um, that our students had to go to um, only had certain hours. And with the pandemic, those hours were um, you know, just profoundly cut even more. Uh, so they, they didn't even have the luxury of 10 hours in the classroom. You know, maybe it was two to three hours. So time, you know, to spend with their materials, uh, you know, reading really became, you know, a factor. Uh, so we embedded PDF files of the textbooks into the learner management system, but then looked at adopting clear books. And clear books are, are a laptop that is literally clear so that if there was any attempt to uh, hide contraband, you know, that would be seen. But the adoption of the, of the OERs with the, the clear books was, um, that was just a, a catalyst for moving forward uh, considerably. And, but then the next step was for those students that still preferred um, something to have in their hands and bring back to their, you know, to their housing unit uh, with them, um, they still preferred print. So how was it that we would get printed versions? And so uh, at about, uh, uh, this time last year, we were we knew that we were going to be changing vendors for a bookstore, and um, that wasn't going to be an option anymore. Um, so in this next slide, you know, I can kind of share. I went through the you know the process of just identifying OS for OpenStax or OER uh, Commons. Um, OpenStax was a real good solution for us because they do include um, the service for providing printed copies. Uh, when we adopted a resource from the OER Commons. We didn't have that option, but we were able to work with uh, eCampus, our, our newest uh, bookstore vendor, 
to to provide printed copies, which is um, that's that's kind of a we'll just call it a mandate a voice to us for our customers, our, our students. Um, so there was still was the distribution. How were we going to get OERs? Thankfully, eCampus as a as a bookstore vendor was very amenable to to um, uh, adopting our OERs, uh, something that they really wouldn't make a profit margin off of, um, and also providing print services. So that really helped with the distribution process. But then we had some other things such as, okay, so here's Jim teaching this class. Uh, let's just say it's business law. And where are we keeping the latest and greatest version of business law that we've adopted for this particular population? So saving you know, figuring out a, you know, a game plan to get everyone on board, you know, all the, you know, all the players on board with where we're going to hold the master copies and uh, taking care of print and all that was a, you know, was a, a major, um, we just kind of took it for granted, to be honest. So we, uh, uh, we had to kind of work through that one as a, oh, there's an afterthought. We never thought about that. Um, so we will continue as with this program, we will continue to adopt OERs. Um, they are a solution for us and for this population. Um, you know, we are looking at, I'm going to try my hand even in doing a little bit of authoring and, and uh, uh, taking uh, a couple different resources that I've written in the past and those OERs that are out there and uh, just see if we can't come up with the you know, book that we can adopt and contribute to the uh, open education community, of course. Um, so, uh, but in the future, you know, we, we will continue to expand looking at more courses as more become available. Small business entrepreneurship in general seems to be a, uh, an area where we could use more. We could use more resources. So uh, that will certainly be an option um, as, as more and more resource, resources are added. Um, so I guess with that, I just want to definitely give time to, uh, to Tarek and um, I appreciate the opportunity here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. So many interesting things. We'll have a, a short time for questions and answers after that, but let's uh, turn now to Derek, please. Uh, welcome, and thank you for being willing to share what you're going to share. Sorry about that, Zoom problems, I'm muted. So um, I am going to talk about, well, first off, um, when I was preparing this presentation, I kind of figured I might be short on the end. So when I did a run through, I um, recorded it and I just posted into the chat a recording of my presentation. It's about 18 minutes. So if you're interested in anything that's maybe uh, goes into a little more depth than what I'm gonna go in today, feel free to uh, jump into that. Um, resource right there. It, you could also follow this link once we send out the slides, which have an outline of my presentation, as well as that recording. So my name is Derek Morris. I'm a teacher at Lynn Benton Community College. And what I'm going to talk about today is an OER sprint that I did in the winter of 2020. Um, OER sprint, you get one week to redesign a course to use OER. And I chose my material science text class. Um, material science is a really fun class. We go over um, uh, basic, I'm sorry, we, I'm a little nervous here, just a second. We go over uh, the identification, classifying structure of materials. Um, like most CTE programs, we have a really wide range of students. So we start out with some basic chemistry. And when I took over the course four years ago, my text, my curriculum was a manila folder full of handouts and a really experienced teacher who was retiring. So I've been looking for a textbook to ever since. Um, it's really hard to find a textbook for a material science class because anything titled material science is going to be engineering level college um, and any basic chemistry text say at the high school level is gonna be way too broad. And I can't make my students buy a chemistry textbook that we're only going to use the first three chapters of. So I've been looking for some sort of text. And in the sprint, I looked at these resources, OER Commons and Skills Commons, which have a ton of resources available. Um, LibreText and CK12 are also databases of resources, but they also allow you to remix and customize existing OERs to create your own custom textbook. So right away, I focused on LibreText and CK12. 
um, to try and create a textbook for my class. Um, quick comparison of the two, CK-12 is easier and quicker to use, um, focuses on the high school level, but that was really good for my class because I was really teaching some basic chemistry at the beginning of the course. Um, Libre Text is a much more expansive database. Um, it has a lot more college level stuff. It has a workforce section, which would be really great and more applicable for most CTE programs. Um, downside of Libre Text is the more powerful but complicated interface. You create a, a remix map, sort of browse all the materials um, and pick what you want to do, pull it into a textbook, and then you can edit it. Um, so both of these look really good to me, but I ended up going with CK12, mostly with the one week OER sprint that um, I had, uh, the one week I had uh, of time I had available. I liked the easier interface and really the high school level was more appropriate for the basic chemistry that I was teaching my students. Um, so I created this material science textbook. There's a, a link on the previous slide. Um, I was pretty happy with it. It was a huge improvement over the previous year. My ability to assign students um, reading um, for classes they missed or if they had trouble following lectures was great. Um, it was good material for teaching myself on some of these topics that I was rusty on. But soon after I completed it, I will COVID hit. And uh, we went to, we pivoted to remote teaching um, and time that I was really planning on spending continuing to customize the text went to other things, converting all my courses to online, etc. cetera. Um, so the textbook that I have now that I created, it's not really ideal and I kept looking for something uh, better. Um, so one of the topics in my class that's really hard to find material on is the crystal structure of metals. Most chemistry texts really focus on liquid chemistry, and the like, and we do a lot with metals and stuff in my class. So I've always been searching for new material on that. Just basically on a random Google search, I came on, came up with, found this site from the Iowa State University. Um, and it's their non-destructive testing department. And I'm gonna really quickly show you this site because it is really amazing. Um, I like the structure of it. It's licensed Creative Commons, so I can, cut and paste out of here, I can remix it, I can put it in handouts, I can assign reading. Um, this section is one of my favorite sections here, but they have atomic theory here, really great background information. And I've used this extensively now in my curriculum to the point where it's replaced the textbook that I created through uh, CK12. Um, I had, didn't find it, in the OER Commons or Skills Commons, it may be there, but the search interface on those can be problematic to find your resources. Um, so I wanted to talk about another type of material that I use in my class and use this to transfer into a quick little demo if I have time. Um, I used to be a, in software development and we would talk about um, free software and we talk about free as in speech or free as in beer. And free in, in speech is the OER stuff. It's everything I've been covering so far. Um, that's the stuff that you can use it how you want, remix it how you want, find out how it's made, all that. Free beer software, it's free to use, but you don't get any control of it. It could disappear at any point. You don't get to modify the recipe or anything like that. Free, free speech software is best, but free beer is pretty good too. So I incorporate things like uh, materials from Sandvik Cormorant, um, some uh, non-free e-learning stuff by companies. I also include enthusiast videos that are really good. All of this, when I'm teaching it, I, I like to use it as a lesson in digital literacy. Obviously, these people are advertising to you. These people are entertaining to you. You can't take it for at face value, but it's still really useful, and it especially appeals to some of my younger students. Um, it kicks them off doing research on their own. So in this whole process where I really had some trouble finding resources for my classes, I came up with this thing called the CT Online Research Project. And I, I've received a fellowship from Lynn Benton this uh, year to work on it. It's definitely a work in progress. It's not designed to replace OER Commons or Skills Commons by any stretch, but what it is, it's an idea of crowdsourcing an online database of these resources. And let me give you a quick demo of it. So 
with this online database, it's built on top of WordPress, um, which is a open source uh, blog engine used on almost 50% of the websites around. So I could come here and look, and if I want something on say micrometers, if I could spell it right, and I immediately can see all the resources I have on micrometers and I can, it's tagged and linked by creator. So if I, oh, let's see what they have on inspection. Really quickly, I can see everything on inspection. And then I can click on the resource and look at the resource and realize, oh, that's part of the Wisconsin online collection. So I can look at the Wisconsin online collection and I can see what they have. If I see a creator that I like, I can click on the creator see everything that that creator produces. And once again, click on the resource and go to the resource. So it's a pretty quick and easy way to find resources that are available online. Each resource can have a comment thread so instructors can discuss how they've used the resource or what is useful to them about it. Um, and then because, and I'm not logged in at the moment, because it's built on top of WordPress, you get all the back end stuff where you can reclassify and manage your resources. So um, that is the CT online resource project that I wanted to give a quick demo of. It's a work in progress. It's not quite there yet, but if you're interested in checking it out, it's up on the demo site. And if you'd like to help, if you have graphic design skills, web design skills, WordPress skills, or you just want to learn and you're interested and you think it's a good project, I would love help with it. As they say with every project, the last 20% takes 80% of the time, and I'm about 50% of the way through. So um, that's what I have for you. Once again, if you have any, if any more interest in it, you can contact me um, or anything I've talked, or you could watch the slightly longer video that I posted to the chat. Excellent, excellent resources. And I would like to uh, thank all of our presenters today, again, for being willing to share your process, your stuff, your mistakes, and um, uh, yeah, everything that you've um, shared with us. Thank you. Um, I wanted to encourage you, and I wanted to tell you too that Liz will be sending out a recording and um, information on uh, how to contact any of our presenters today for extra questions. I only saw a few questions um, to the where are your resources? And so I believe you've all included your email addresses and information uh, so people can contact you. Any, any, I would like to get us out of here in time. Um, so let me share our upcoming 2022 spring webinars. We have in during Open Education Week, uh, a few webinars centered on leadership in April on sustainable OER course design and in May institutional policies and practices. Um, so that's a few of our websites, uh, our upcoming webinars now. Of course, if you want to stay in the loop, um, please do. We have a pretty active CCC OER community email. It's one of the most active emails I've ever seen. And our, please uh, check out our um, EDI blog posts and student OER impact stories. I'm also watching the chat here for questions if you have any. If you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to provide some feedback on our survey um, on the webinar, um, we'd like to make these webinars um, meet your needs. Um, so the survey link, Liz has put the survey link in the chat. And uh, again, if you'd like to contact CCC OER staff or Una or Liz, their emails are in there. And we'll stay on for just a couple minutes if you'd like, if you have any questions, but I wanted to make sure we, we uh, you had information before we finished. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, I hope our presenters can see what's happening here in the chat. Very well done. Thanks so much for all the information. Great information. And uh, any questions? as we 
Let's see. Joanna says, I'm a librarian. I have faculty switching to OER who miss the question banks. Any tips on replacing or creating those? Well, I'll jump in if nobody else wants to. Um, there's been some very interesting approaches to that. Um, some faculty have actually asked their students to help out with um, generating a, a test bank for them. Um, obviously under um, you know, faculty um, uh, encouragement and assessment, uh, but that, that is one way of doing it. And obviously you can also work with other faculty within your discipline to work together on that. Definitely. I've moved away from tests in my OER, moved to journal responses instead, and it's a little easier. I have to come up with one question. <laughs> Tarek, did you have a, a thought on question banks here? Um, I don't think I did, but I was actually just off looking at, I think LibreText and CK12 have different types of resources that um, you can create questions and uh, questions and quizzes and stuff like that and share them over that. I don't know how much they've been used, but that would be another resource. Certainly if you're creating your resource through either of those services, I think you can include quizzes and text tests along with it. And I think both uh, Sharon and Whitney and Jessica, you've, you've moved into a little bit more of open pedagogy where students are creating projects, right? Instead of the quiz testing, quiz, quiz banks. We use both still. So we test kind of baseline knowledge to make sure everyone understands it through quizzes. And we're happy to share those quizzes if anyone needs them. So if, if you were on our website and you were reading like how to use the text, there is a little blurb that says we have um, additional resources that can be shared through like a Canvas Commons, uh, but most of our assessment is done through projects and hands-on activities. Mm -hmm. And likewise, I do have project-based, but for the quizzes, um, I have my students create their own quiz questions, which I think I find to be a little bit more challenging for some. Um, so I'm definitely going to continue that practice because it gives them that opportunity to really, really reflect on the materials that they're learning versus me just doing a bank uh, set of questions that they can Google um, when they're creating their own. It's kind of, it's a little bit more um, reflective for them. Yes. Thank you, everybody. And if you have had a few minutes to take the survey, we appreciate your attendance and uh, hopefully we'll see you again in March.